Roads are more than just grey strips of asphalt dividing up the landscape. All over the world, roads are communication routes linking important places. They can be seen as the prerequisite for human coexistence. It was only through the construction of roads that trade and travel became possible. For centuries now, roads have been a rich source of tales and history, but some of them harbour dangers, death and a lot of human suffering. Worldwide in the 20th century alone, some 35 million people lost their lives on roads and a further one and a half billion were injured. What this man says applies to far too many routes. Some of the world's most dangerous roads are located in the mountains, far away from civilization. Others, totally congested and seemingly devoid of any order, run through towns and villages or through major cities. Some roads were built under appalling conditions by slave labourers and prisoners of war. Others are even in the grip of evil spirits, which, so the locals believe, kill travellers. Roads overcome mountains and force travellers to look down into chasms, or they bridge them. Roads are the arteries of humankind, its cities and its economies. Anyone travelling on roads where death stalks is taking a great risk. But usually, there is no alternative. The Salang Tunnel in Afghanistan is a horrific road through dust and ice in Taliban country. Anyone taking this route through the Hindu Kush is challenging fate. This tunnel really scares me. If a tanker explodes in a tunnel like this, there's no escape. No way you can save yourself. You've had it. The three kilometer long tunnel at an altitude of 3,900 meters is only one of many risks on the Salang Road, the only route from Kabul, the capital, to northern Afghanistan. Landslides and avalanches, along with roadside booby traps, are among the many dangers that make the route more than just an arduous challenge. There are many good reasons for avoiding the Salang Road. But anyone wanting to transport goods and raw materials to supply the Afghan capital or to travel to northern Afghanistan has no alternative. In Afghanistan, Ali Askar Lali is a national hero and sporting role model. An ex-member and coach of the Afghan national football team and former general secretary of the Afghan Football Association, he now works for the German FA, helping to develop school and mass sport in Afghanistan from grassroots right up to the men's and women's national teams. Ali travels the length and breadth of Afghanistan, furthering the development of boys and girls through sports and educational projects. As a child, he himself used to travel on the load bed of trucks, but those days are long gone. Today, the Salang Road too is no place for carefree outings. Traveling on roads in Afghanistan is always risky. There's a general fear of terrorist attacks. Vehicles of all kinds are filled with explosives, driven into crowds of people and detonated. The state informs its citizens via SMS about curfews and travel restrictions in the country. The messages are short and clear. No movements from 6 a.m. Travel impossible. And when travel is permitted, strict controls are imposed to protect people. Cars, bicycles and even pedestrians are searched at checkpoints for weapons and explosives. Time and again, suicide bombers kill innocent civilians. Explosive devices can be concealed by the roadside, which detonate when a car drives over them. The situation is made even worse by the fact that, because they are afraid of being blown up as far as possible, most motorists drive in the middle of the road. 
taking this road has become very dangerous. Accidents occur every day with many fatalities. There are no road signs to regulate traffic. People drive any way they want. There is no speed limit. Many drive too fast. This narrow road with its many bends sometimes sees the most horrific, deadly accidents. This mangled wreckage gives a stark indication of the dramas that can unfold on the Salang Road. Dramas caused by blind bends, poor surfaces, and drivers who have good reason for fearing roadside bombs. But if they are somehow to survive, people here have to travel and go to work. Many drivers on the Salang Road are good mechanics, but those who can't help themselves are stuck, at least for a few days. And up here, with no cell phone reception, no water and no food, that can prove disastrous. What's more, there are also armed bandits, sometimes wearing stolen police uniforms, who don't hesitate to open fire. They steal trucks and their loads. Time and again, truckers are killed when they're ambushed or drive over an explosive device. Thirty-eight-year-old Rasigon comes from Pakistan. All the men in his family, his father, his brothers and his grandfather, are truck drivers. If everything goes smoothly, they cover the 400 kilometers from Islamabad to the Afghan border in 28 hours. Four men share the driving day and night. With their metal bells and fluttering black cloths, Pakistani trucks are masterpieces of decoration. The cloths are designed to ward off the evil eye and to confuse anyone staring at the truck for too long and without reason. That's what truckers here believe and they seek spiritual support. The road is incredibly bad and dangerous. In many places, it's just scree. The security forces on the road can't stand us truckers. They insult us and hit us if we break down. Recently, I wanted to drive through the icy tunnel, but even though I had chains on two of my 12 wheels, I still couldn't get any purchase on the road. So I had to walk through the tunnel and come back with four more chains. They were incredibly heavy. I just about made it. Large sections of the Salang Road are not paved. Many trucks don't even make it when the road is dry. And in snow and ice, some truckers just slide down the mountain with their foot permanently jammed on the brake. When that happens, the road becomes a nightmare. Once we got stuck for a whole week, we just couldn't go on. It was really cold with snow everywhere. Up here, you're at the end of the world. You can't buy anything. So the only food is what you've brought with you. It was a really dangerous situation. I'm glad we didn't starve or freeze to death. I thought the snowstorm was going to kill us. The truckers prepare for bad weather. They take emergency rations and water with them. But even before the strenuous climb into the mountains begins, they're threatened by a totally different scenario. In recent years, more than 60 men have been killed in attacks on trucks. Shootings and kidnappings even occur during the daytime. A year ago, for instance, you couldn't drive after two in the afternoon because lots of people were being abducted by the Taliban. Many were even killed. When the weather is fine, some might find the wild beauty of the landscape somehow exhilarating. But up here, it always pays to be vigilant. For example, if you're traveling with bodyguards, or if you've already made it known that you're on a certain mission that might offend the Taliban. If, for instance, they know that you plan to do something involving women's football, that could be dangerous.
Ali has often been threatened. If he didn't stop coaching girls, he was told something would happen to him. When he received that threat back in 2009, he left Afghanistan for a while. In the meantime, a tailback has occurred in one of the galleries. The access road to the actual tunnel, which is protected against rockfall, is blocked. That's not a good sign. Suddenly, there's a lot of shouting from inside. Drivers are milling around. Many of them are frightened. They all know what can happen on the Salang Road. There are no rules here. In this tight situation, things can easily get out of control. On one side, a tractor unit with a defective transmission has broken down in the tunnel. Two trailers in the middle of the tunnel have got their loads caught. the other end, a military convoy is exerting pressure. The soldiers couldn't care less if some load or other has got snagged. They want to get through and are harassing the drivers. It doesn't matter to them if the bodywork gets scratched. This is everyday life in the tunnel. While a few drivers are still working on the transmission, the traffic is able to squeeze past. A few shovelfuls of sand on the frozen surface and things can at last get going again. Everyone just wants to get out of the gallery and the close confines of the tunnel. <laughs> Rasigon, our Pakistani truck driver, finally reaches the next gallery. And this is the view he has of the road. It's an extremely strenuous trip. The route demands great concentration, especially with regard to oncoming traffic. Ali, too, is glad every time he drives out of the oppressive darkness and can head on to his football project in the north. There are just as many trucks on the road on the other side of the tunnel. This route carries all the goods traffic from Pakistan through northern Afghanistan and on to Kabul. When you're gone over the Salang Pass, the road is a disaster. It's full of huge ruts caused by the excessive weight of the trucks that use it. Between seven and 8,000 trucks struggle through the tunnel every day, but no one keeps a record of the ones that don't make it. How many break down or are involved in an accident? It's said that before 2014, when thousands of ISAF troops were still in the country, around 16,000 trucks used the Salang Road every day. The sparse remnants of the asphalt surface bear sad testimony to the time. In some places, the ruts are so deep that vehicles heading downhill are almost impossible to steer. This man is the guardian of a memorial site. In the 1990s, he had to flee to Iran because of the Taliban. In 2003, he and his family returned in a bus, but he was the only one to survive the trip. We were coming along here when our driver misjudged the steepness of the road and lost control. Our bus collided with a tanker coming uphill and exploded. 28 men, women and children were killed. I was the only survivor. Today I live in Masai Sharif. 
but I often come here to tend to the memorial site. I get by on donations. On Fridays, many people come here to pray. For the many innocent victims of this road. The road is already in a pitiful state, and the snow makes everything a lot worse, the old man says. He asked drivers on the route for a few Afghani, a small donation for him and the monument. Truckers like Rasigon use this road to supply Kabul with fruit and vegetables and to take raw materials like coal back to Pakistan, Turkmenistan or Uzbekistan. On each trip, Rasigon earns around $200. With that, he can make ends meet, but his income comes from a risky profession. No one wants to hang around here any longer than is absolutely necessary. Afghanistan, a country somewhere between war and peace, surrounded by mountains. It is dependent on the arduous link the Salang Road provides between the capital, the northern part of the country and Pakistan. For truckers, for football expert Ali Lali, and all the others who have to continue using the road, it means driving at the limit every time. The Moloto Road in northern Pretoria. Death lurks on this road and people fear it, but for many there is no alternative. They have to travel on it by day and by night. The route has seen so much suffering and tragedy. It is even said to be possessed by evil spirits and demons. With anger in their voices, some pray for an end to the many fatal accidents on the Moloto Road. Others are virtually overwhelmed by pain and desperation, like this man. The killer road, the killer road, the killer road. I repeat myself for the sake of vividness or rather clarity. It's a killer road. A killer road, killer road. I'm enough. His sister was hit by a car at dusk and dragged 50 meters. She died by the roadside. That was in 2012. At first glance, the Moloto Road is just a narrow strip of tarmac linking Johannesburg and Pretoria with the barren hinterland of Mpumalanga in the north. Jobs in the north, with its weak infrastructure, are scarce. So it's quite common for people living in places like Frischgewagd or Kvagafontein to commute 200 kilometers to and from work every day. Sifu Masombuka is a journalist with the Pretoria Times. He uses the Maloto Road every day. Sifo comes from the area. For years now, he's been writing about the traffic problem, about accidents and the people involved in them. He'd always been close to danger through his job, but what Sifo experienced in 2013 changed his life completely. It's something that will stuck uh, with me for the rest of my life. You know, seeing uh, people's heads rolling on uh, the tar, and uh, the most horrific was you know, when people had to go there to identify their relatives, uh, they, were, they, they told me that they were picking up legs uh, just to mesh the shoe, to say, okay, this must be my uh, daughter's leg because it has the same shoe. So it was horrific. This is a terrible spot for Sifo, one he tries to avoid. Now we are approaching the spot where 30 people from my village died, and my friends. On the morning of November the 12th, 2013, a tipper truck like this one, a lorry, a car and a bus were all involved in that horrific accident which hit the headlines. The international press called the Maloto Road a killer road, and not for the first time. And it was a rainy night, so the road was slippery. Those guys didn't have a chance. So their fate was sealed immediately when that, uh, the truck hit the tipper truck from behind. 
The dump truck swerved to avoid a car with no lights on and hit another truck at full speed. The force of the collision hurled the second truck into the bus. All the passengers sitting on the right-hand side were killed instantly. The 29 people who were seriously injured were treated by doctors and paramedics. In South Africa, tragic incidents like that dominate the media and political reporting for several days. But as in other cases, life on the Maloto Road returned to normal and with it, the risks for commuters. One of them is adamant that the government must finally do something. The government is now having an obligation of trying to save people's lives without politicizing any matter. Because if we put politics into this matter, that won't resolve anything. You politicize, people are dying. You keep on politicizing, people are dying. So the best way is to try to resolve the matter. Plan A, they can extend the road. Plan B, in each and every 100 kilometers, there should be traffic officers. That's it. But with no real solution in sight, public anger erupts time and again in the form of roadblocks and barricades. For years now, the road itself has been the scene of protests. People long since became sick and tired of speeches in Parliament. The taxi companies have become the main figures in the daily battle on the Molotov Road. Only a few commuters can afford the luxury of a car. So for the thousands who work in Pretoria, the white taxis are indispensable. One operator runs seven or eight taxis en routes to the Johannesburg and Pretoria metro regions, a trip of about 150 kilometers. Cost, roughly 12 euros per passenger. A fully occupied taxi can have up to 18 people on board. It's a lucrative but brutal business because every customer counts. On this road, money and power play a major role. Direct competition comes from the orange Putco buses. Since 1945, they've been taking black workers to where they're needed but can't live because accommodation in Pretoria is scarce and expensive. The taxi drivers, of course, have their personal opinions of the competition. For a few months, there were no Putco buses on the road because the drivers had gone on strike. During that time, no accidents were reported. So I can only recommend people to use our taxis instead of buses. In my view, most accidents are caused by bus drivers. Putco buses are often involved in accidents, but 200 of them carrying 50,000 passengers are in operation on the Maloto Road every day. 45-year-old Tisha van de Venter, who runs a filling station here, witnesses the horror on the road every day. She grew up on a farm and learned to drive when the Maloto Road was still a dirt track. Her filling station is used by taxis and buses. After just a few kilometers with Tisha at the wheel, you've got a pretty good idea of what driving on the Maloto Road entails. The taxi business is almost like a, a mini mafia. They, they think they own the road. And then you've got the Patco buses who are bigger and they think they own the road. So there's, between the two, there's a lot of competition for space, physical space on the road and speed because the one wants to get there faster than the other one. Tisha has brought us to an ordinary roundabout right in front of her filling station. During the daytime, you can't really do anything wrong. But at night, instead of going round the roundabout, many motorists fail to see the few traffic signs and simply drive straight on into it. That's why the roundabout is a permanent building site. Several drivers have decapitated themselves through ploughing head-on into the concrete structures on the roundabout. The streetlights in the background are a part of sad reality. The other funny thing is that I've noticed and there's quite a bit of it. They want to make it a safer place. They've put lighting in. But the lights, of course, don't work because all the cables have been stolen. Thus, it only gets really dangerous on the Maloto Road when dusk falls. But that's when thousands are returning to their villages after a long day's work in the city. 
and the number of commuters is steadily increasing because no worker can afford the high rents in Pretoria. As a result, there is less and less room on the roads. It is illegal to cross the continuous line on the far left of the road. The dark, unpaved strip is reserved for pedestrians, cyclists and herds of livestock. But motorists have long been turning the two narrow lanes into four, even at night and often with fatal consequences. Pedestrians wanting to cross the road can suddenly appear as if from nowhere. Not everyone is as lucky as these two. According to police statistics, most victims on the Maloto Road are killed in the early morning or the late evening. This taxi also came off the road in the dark. 70% of all accidents here are put down to human error caused by working long hours, drinking alcohol or driving dangerously. You only need to lose concentration for a second for the left side wheels to drift onto the sandy ground next to the road and threaten not only the lives of those traveling in the vehicle, but also any pedestrians nearby. This motorist was lucky. His small car with three women and a little child in it came off a straight stretch of road when he swerved to avoid an obstacle. One passenger has a broken leg and there are some cuts and lacerations to be treated, but the child is uninjured. There are no statistics on how many accidents are caused by fatigue following a hard day at work. The police regularly make checks on the load vehicles are carrying and on their roadworthiness. But even so, this strip of asphalt claims numerous victims every year. There are no less than 24 risk zones on the Maloto Road, but there are voices that make totally different powers responsible for the deaths on the route. Situated not far from the road, this house is home to a religious authority. Isaac Malaza is a celebrated figure in the area because, as a bishop, he fights for the survival of people on the Maloto Road. A taxi rank on the road. Every few days, the bishop comes to the Maloto Road itself to talk to people because he thinks it's not enough just to preach in church. In 1999, he says Jesus came to him in a dream and told him to help people here. And now that is his mission. He appeals to the conscience of taxi and bus drivers, imploring them not to drive too fast or under the influence. He also mentions far worse dangers on the Maloto Road. Uh, there are blood-drinking demons who have this road in their power. Some families don't bring home any relatives who have been killed on it. But if nobody cares for these poor souls and brings them home, they will become evil spirits. Such demons are to blame for the many accidents and deaths on this road. So Isaac fights the demons on the road itself. I command you devils to take your greedy fingers off the bus's brakes, he shouts. Leave the cars and the people in peace. The bishop's mission is neither folklore, nor is it the excessive zeal of some preacher acting alone. It is simply part of the culture here. Tisha van der Venter is well aware of the importance of such rituals. It's very important for them that if somebody is knocked down, that they have what they call a cleansing ceremony, where they go to the actual site and they wash the site and they, you know, they, they wash off the blood and they get, you know, one of the pastors or a church person comes along and, um, you know, they, they pray and they, you know, do, you know, have a whole little ceremony where they cleanse the road so as to, to drive away, you know, the bad spirits and things like that. And so Isaac blesses the many Putko buses and prays fervently for the safe arrival of all commuters. Mr. Malaza for the, the, the pray for this road, everything. Go drive, stop your life. 
Good drive! For a good six years now, politicians have been arguing about the right measures for making the Molotov Road safer. Some recommend basic structural improvements, others would like to see the construction of a railway line. But as long as demons keep demanding so many sacrifices, Bishop Malaza will maintain his fight against the evil spirits and continue to preach on the Maloto Road. Driving in India is a challenge for everyone, even for those who have pushed themselves to the limit on Afghanistan's deadly roads and survived evil demons on routes in South Africa. India's roads are extreme, and as even the locals themselves will tell you, on the mountain roads of the north, the dangers are even greater. I think it's a very hard job to drive in India. It's not an easy, uh, this thing. I think once if you drive in India or you drive in the mountain roads, you can drive everywhere in the world, I think. Yeah, you will see the cows also there. <laughs> the drive from Kulu province in the federal state of Himachal Pradesh to the mountain of dead bodies is a 93 kilometer long adrenaline rush on difficult and narrow roads that are full of nasty surprises every day. No one knows the number of hairy situations and near collisions that occur. Sometimes drivers are lucky, but not always. there's been yet another accident on the winding N21 national route. A truck has somehow plunged backwards down a slope and overturned. Even before the police arrive in the early morning by motorcycle, onlookers are already discussing how the accident happened. The driver of the truck, it seems, wanted to avoid an obstacle that had suddenly appeared in the dark. It might have been a car with no lights on or a stray cow, he couldn't tell exactly. He tells officers that as he was manoeuvring in the dark, shortly afterwards he lost his bearings and nearly plunged into the gorge. He just managed to get out by climbing through a window. Many people say that truckers and bus drivers dominate the roads. Bus drivers regard the road as their workplace. It's mainly the others, they claim, who are impatient. We keep telling our passengers, these men say, that they just have to be patient. We do our best, but we don't promise them that they'll arrive on time. If you get killed along the way, we tell them, you'll never even reach your destination, because the roads here are so dangerous. The bus park, just outside Manali. There is a small regional airport nearby, but because of the high mountains and the poor visibility, flight connections are regarded as unreliable. Consequently, tourists heading for the north from the capital, New Delhi, would rather opt for the 14-hour bus journey. This bus park is somewhere the drivers can take a rest and also swap news and information. They meet friends and family, have something to eat and drink, and try to recover from the strains and stresses of their last trip. There's not much time to carry out all the repairs the buses need, and with 60 to 70 buses arriving here every day from Delhi and other cities in the densely populated south, the small workshops in the region are never short of work. The poor road conditions place heavy demands on buses. Bus drivers claim there are also other reasons for the chaos on the road. Rock falls and potholes, they say, are only part of the reality. Motorists and motorcyclists, we learn, are a major problem. They never use their rear-view mirror. There's constant friction, the men say. But we can't keep getting out and having a fight. It's a fairly long trip, so they try to stay cool. But the fact is, nobody here abides by the rules. Tailbacks are often caused by flocks of sheep and herds of cattle wandering across the road. You slow down, he says, but then cars force their way past or simply turn around, causing you to slam on the brakes, and the whole bus shudders. It's crazy. For years now, India has held a sombre leading position in the global traffic statistics kept by the WHO, the World Health Organization. 
In 2013, more than 200,000 road deaths were registered, half of them pedestrians. Even if the size of the country and the poor quality of many of its roads are taken into account, that is still an alarming figure. With all the cars and motorcycles, animals of all kinds and commuters in countless regional buses travelling and working on the road, it's becoming more and more stressful. When I have to brake heavily, passengers sometimes scream, but most of them are used to it. Few people between Lulu and Manali own a car, so the yellow regional buses here are indispensable. But passengers' nerves are always on edge. Surprises and obstacles can lurk behind every bend. Here, you can never feel totally safe. The poor state of roads are the problem, he says. He can cope with the traffic. In fact, he likes driving here in the mountains, but the locals are poor drivers. They cause him serious problems. For Indian tourists, the trip to the north is a serpentine adventure. But for those who live here, it's part of everyday life. The regional bus drivers know every bend and slope on their route, but they can never be certain what they're going to encounter. Working for many years as a trucker and taxi driver, Sunjav Sherman experienced roads all over India. Today, he's a social worker. He looks after accident victims, especially the bus and truck drivers who break down on the road between Kulu and Manali. Anyone who wants to travel safely on mountain roads here in the north would do well to heed Sunjav's advice. You just have to be very careful. You have to be on your side because the, the Delhi people, they don't leave the road. You have to be right, I mean, they will push you out of the road. They'll they push they you out of. They push you just over the cliff. If you yeah, yeah, if you're if you not careful. You have to take care of your car and yourself, you know. Otherwise, they'll push you and throw you out of the cliff. They don't care. With a jagged cliff face on the one side and a steep gorge on the other, Driving on India's mountain roads is often a question of self-assertion, one which, for some, proves fatal. In the summer months, everything floods onto the road leading into the mountains. Goods, traffic, animals and commuters. For Hindu pilgrims in their bright orange robes, the trip to their temples in the north is far more than just an excursion. The road belongs to everyone, but most road users show little respect for traffic regulations. Adopting a cavalier attitude, many think, oh, everything will be fine. When the truck starts going up and down, then it's like, a, oh, wow. What Sanjav means quickly becomes clear. A load and passengers on one truck, or blind bends. Here you see minor body damage all the time. In some places, the road is actually far too narrow for such high trucks and overloaded transporters. Blasting a new lane out of the rock would take time and money. But with trucks getting bigger and bigger, unless the state of the road surface is improved, the consequences will be easy to predict. Uphill or downhill, everyone wants to make progress and as fast as possible. a section of the road some six kilometers north of Manali. The border road organization, the BRO, is part of the Indian military. It was BRO sappers who blasted this strategically important road out of the rock in difficult terrain nearly half a century ago. Since then, the military unit has monitored the annual repair work. Not only does the BRO determine when the road is safe enough to be open for tourists and pilgrims in the summer, in late October, it also checks the state of the road and decides when it will have to be closed. That all depends on the temperature and the degree of rain and snow. When the road was constructed in the 1970s, the BRO told India's motorists to remember that it was built not only with cement and concrete, but also with the blood of many workers. It should not be forgotten, they said, that many of the workers had paid for the road with their health and, in many cases, with their lives. Even today, road construction is still tough work here. Often, there's no room to use heavy machinery. 
and besides, the substrate is far too soft. If necessary, the men and women in the construction teams also have to work at temperatures of around 20 below. They live in accommodation right next to the road, and that too has its dangers. It's a, it's a, it's a total sliding area. It's a 50 meter in length, and it's a complete slide prone. So regular slides due to rainfall, snowfall, water seepages, uh, and uh, that's why uh, this area is a little bit difficult to maintain. Despite great efforts by the state, the impact of the forces of nature in the forms of heavy downpours and hard frost cannot be always kept under control. But the N21 is the only road to the border with Tibet. For that reason alone, as its owner and operator, the military closely monitors the road, here too, in an emergency, it must be possible to move troops into the mountains very quickly. At the Border Road Organization's headquarters, the commander of the Mountain Warriors explains how the 3,980-metre-high Rotang Pass came by its name, what Rotang actually means. Why it is called a uh, mountain of dead bodies is a lot of casualties have taken place while people crossing across Rotang Top. Somehow, the rush to the mountain in summer has to be curbed and, at the same time, the road widened. To prevent everything up here sinking into total chaos, the number of vehicles allowed to set out for the Rothang Pass from Manali is limited to a thousand a day. Turning back is forbidden. Anyone returning to Manali on the same day their permit is issued must pay a fine of between 70 and 140 euros, because then, theoretically, there would be 1,001 vehicles on the mountain. So the pass leading to Tibet has to be crossed on the day stipulated. The commander reminds us why, for the time being, this road will remain one of the most dangerous in the world. A lot of sacrifice is done by our men while constructing this road. Uh, when we do the, uh, it, we start off by uh, doing the formation cutting, which is on a, a mountainous terrain. It is a very arduous task and the lot of uh, people get injured during the uh, formation cutting of hard hard rock or uh, because of the sliding of the stones uh, that is the reason why a lot of sacrifice has taken place during this construction part footage of the peak taken in early july the road as far as lee should have been open some time ago but in march more than 3 meters of new snow fell during the clearance work three of the 220 workers were killed. These casualties have, have happened because of the avalanches which trigger uh, on mountain peaks. And uh, there, are, there is hardly any warning to these avalanches. And uh, th this is the difficulty which we may be facing uh, while clearing the snow uh, at mountain peaks. The huge appeal of the snow-covered peaks for Indians from the hot cities of the south remains unbroken. This car is in the way, so without hesitation, it's overturned. Anyone seeking peace and quiet in natural surroundings drives the Rothang Pass quickly, because even though the road beyond the mountain of dead bodies still has its dangers, there is far less traffic on it. When the military close off the road in November because of snow, the 20,000 people who live up here are cut off from the valley by the Rothang Pass. A tunnel would make the road usable all year round, but until it's driven 8.8 kilometres through the Himalayan massive, travelling on the NH21 will remain a trip into the unknown. Some of the dangers on roads have natural causes. Travellers are under threat from the climate, avalanches and landslides. Other risk factors include family duties, pressure at work and social hardship. They force people to take a risk in getting from A to B every day. Other dangers can be put down to human error, like a lack of concentration or a mistake at the wheel. But simple bad luck can also mean tragedy on the roads of death. <laughs>